Hi everyone, it's Genevieve from Kangaroo Time. Thank you so much for watching the recording of our webinar right now. At Kangaroo Time, we create software for childcare centers. We're an all-in-one solution that helps centers grow their business, connect with their families, and effectively manage their staff members. Our software will help you automate your entire business, including payments, billing, check-in and check-out for children, keeping track of staff hours, we also do classroom automation, and this gives your teacher prompts while they're in the classroom to update parents on feedings, diaper changes, and developmental milestones. And it really hardware wires the parents into the early education experience, and they get a beautiful feed of content right on their smartphones. So if you're looking for billing and a payment solution, a parent app, or a staff scheduling, contact Kangaroo at Time today. Thanks so much, and enjoy the webinar. All right, we are live. Hey, everybody, thanks for joining. Uh, this is new for us, or for me. Uh, Danny, I know you're, you're more of a night owl than I am. Um, no, just kidding. No, this is, uh, this is our, our latest webinar, and I think I like it. It's the end of the day. Um, and For the East Coasters. <laughs> yeah, for the East Coasters, you guys are done with your work. Right. It's 7 p.m., and you guys... I've already cracked open uh, an alcoholic beverage, most likely. Um, maybe not, maybe not. But um, yeah, let's let's get started. Uh, and, uh, and while people are joining, I can do some a little bit of high, housekeeping. But hi, everybody. Um, my name's Scott Wayman. I'm the CEO and founder here at Kangaroo Time. We thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, our, our webinar is with Danny Christine, uh, who's a consultant and center owner. Um, we're th thrilled to bring you this webinar and talk about how to start your own child care center, your own early education center. Um, so Danny, thanks for joining us and we'll get to your content in just a moment. Let me introduce a few things and, and, and housekeep. Um, we know a lot of you are new to our webinars, so I'd like to acquaint you with our company. Um, Kangaroo Time is a company that creates software for early education schools and childcare centers, and we help you optimize the business. Uh, I founded Kangaroo Time in 2015. I felt the education industry was severely lacking in, in technology and tools. As a parent, I saw how challenging the business was and how dynamic it was and knew you all needed help. Um, today, we partner with the best people on the earth and, and see how um, it, it's amazing to see how our software makes their lives so much easier. And in fact, um, if you want to learn more, please go to this site, kangarootime.com slash schedule. Get to our website, you'll find a place for, um, for jumping on one of our group demos. You don't have to talk to our salespeople. You can just sit in, listen, and go along for the ride. Just like this webinar, you never know what you're gonna hear, um, but, but we'd love to have you on our, our webinars. Um, also, for those of you um, that have not joined, please go to our blog. Um, our blog is here at kangarootime.com. Um, we have been so lucky to have thought leaders like Danny come on board and bless us with great content. Um, there's everything here. Um, Prana, uh, Prana uh, last week did a, a session on executive function and learning and, um, and working with, with those brains and uh, the, those, those kind of like those cognitive abilities um, that, that need uh, some, some specialty training. It was a great, it was a great session. And being ADD myself and, uh, and, and knowing that consciously I have to work on executive function, I was, I paid attention the entire time. I, I, I mean, that, that's how great it was. Uh, and then there are, there's so much content here. Our team's always posting and we're always kind of cross blogging with childcare CRM or with Danny or with uh, uh, Sheer Leibwitz. Um, you can see here, there's, there's all kinds of content. It's an embarrassment of wealth when it comes to content. And speaking of an embarrassment of wealth, 
please join our the Kangaroo Time YouTube channel. Um, subscribe. We will not bother you. Um, we we just want you to have access to the content that we're producing every week. Uh, and and again, there is some gold here. You will find something uh, that you'll love for a long trip, um, for while while you're driving to work. Um, we've just gotten a, an amazing feedback uh, library here. It's it's a lot. It's greatness. And then for those of you that want to interact uh, with with more um, with more intimacy and and get feedback, join our KT Child Care Connect Facebook group. Again, we are not here to pitch you. When COVID started, we made a decision as a company um, that yes, we wanted to grow. Yes, we wanted to to be a financially healthy company. But our number one mission and ethos was for advocacy. We wanted to bring great content to owners and directors out there. We don't want you joining our groups. We don't want you paying, paying a premium to be a part of something. We want to give you this content for free. We, we were really passionate about it. Um, and, and there's good stuff. You'll, you'll always hear me say something off color, especially when I'm talking to Hani. Um, she just kind of brings it out of me. Uh, it's all her fault. Uh, so, so for tonight's webinar, we are going to um, talk a bit about a topic that I'm so happy to bring to you. Um, this world of early education is, is so underserved, and I think we're all about to face a, a very different paradigm when it comes to your businesses and um, whether or not you need to, to really kind of change the way you think. Um, I, I think we're heading into the roaring 20s. And, and I know that we, we do have what we call childcare deserts here in the US uh, and the, the American public is underserved. And I think it is time for the best and brightest entrepreneurs to step in and, and start great businesses. And Danny's here to talk about the fundamentals, um, starting businesses, solving problems, uh, working through capital. Uh, but before we do that, real quick, just some final housekeeping certificates. If you signed up for um, continuing education certs, uh, you will get your cert tomorrow in an email along with a link uh, to this video here. Um, if you have any questions, there's a little bit of a QA. There's a QA um, module here on the in Zoom. Click that. Also, um, let's be active in chat. We love it when we're interactive. I haven't checked it yet because I'm trying to get through the, the um, introduction, uh, but hello, everybody. Uh, we love you. We're glad you're here. Your microphones and cameras, uh, we can't hear you. We can't see it, so don't worry. Uh, and then again, the, the, the follow-up tomorrow will come from Kangaroo Time, and you'll have a link to the, the video on our YouTube channel and all the stuff I've gone through. So sit back, relax, get ready to take notes. And for today's discussion, Danny, I wanna thank you for joining. And for those of uh, you that don't know her, she's a consultant um, and she's done great things through her company, childcaresites.com. And she's the owner of two centers in Long Island, New York. Uh, and she does it all. She spends a little bit of time in Texas and in New York, the great ones do. The great ones, I spent a little time in California and a little bit of time in Buffalo myself. Um, she's been kind enough to join us today to talk about how you can start your own center. And with that said, um, Danny, you own two childcare centers. Can we start there? Can you tell us how you got started? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, yes, I do own two childcare centers right now, Scott, and the, the goal is always growth and expansion for me and my program specifically. Um, but I actually started as a home daycare, well, taking it back even further than that, I started as an assistant teacher in a different childcare program that I was working for. Um, but in 2014, I actually started um, being a childcare business owner myself as a home home daycare provider in Queens, New York. So that's kind of how I got started in the with a home program first. So you went from a home center. So currently, how many families are you serving at your two centers today? 
So we're licensed for 122 kids between both centers. And I would say that as of today, we got a handful of new enrollments today, but as of today, we have um, approximately 115 children between both centers. So 115, about 100 families, because we have a lot of siblings that come to us. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Um, how many staff do you have at each center? Are you are you completely staffed up right now? You know, staffing is a challenge, I think, nationwide. Um, but we have about 30, I want to say like 37 staff members between both sites. And it would be or it should be um, uh, around 39 or 40 if if we were fully enrolled, if we were fully staffed with not having to, you know, ask teachers to stay overtime um, and all of that. But we have some creative scheduling and that's the reason for that. Like we have at one of my sites, we have teachers working four days a week, 10 hours a day. Um, so we kind of have ourselves overstaffed because of that. Um, we figure sometimes that sort of schedule works out better. Um, so yeah, right now between both sites, we have about 35 to 37 staff members. And Danny, uh, just real quick with you, uh, do you have a slide dedicated to your staffing thesis? Um, I don't. Okay, I don't. Just, yeah, just real quick. How, so, so what was the motivator there? I'll tell you, my wife is a nurse and she's now five days a week, but early in her career, she worked three twelves and then she went to four tens. And the, the, so in speaking as her husband, um, it was awesome. I loved, I loved it. You know how great it is to have a full day off during the week to get stuff done. It's, it's really an incredible benefit, but just, just yeah. what, what was your thinking there? Cause I've heard other operators talk about this and, Mm -hmm. And many others have, are, are working on it right now. Yeah, so I I think that it, it, it is kind of subjective to who, I do know that we have some staff that would prefer, you know, to work five days a week, a standard schedule, but a lot of them do love having an extra day off in the middle of the week. Um, but really from, biz, from a business perspective, the reason that we did it is because we needed to bring on, um, we switched back to doing this schedule, I want to say about three months ago, because prior to that, we were doing a standard eight hour work day, eight to eight and a half hour work day. But we were finding that we were having call outs. And because of COVID right now, we're not allowed to have anybody come in if they have the slightest of symptoms. And then they, our policy is that if they have symptoms of COVID, they have to stay out for 72 hours. So it was causing us to be understaffed a lot. And if we were to keep everybody having a five day work week, eight and a half hour days with a half an hour lunch break, and um, taking into consideration that we need to hire more people, um, the majority of the time when, you know, people would not be calling out, we would be overspending on payroll for no reason, right? So in order to kind of offset that, we um, overstaffed, but in reality, we're, we're, it's kind of balancing itself out because everybody has a day off during the week. Now, if somebody does call out, we have a somewhat of a built-in substitute system where we know that we have teachers that are already cleared, background checked, qualified, and familiar with the children um, at home that if they would like to make overtime um, hours, they have the option of doing so if we call them to come in. So it really works out for us right now. It doesn't always. We've had this schedule um, twice before over the years, and we've had the need to change it up a couple of times. Um, and it really just depends on enrollment and the season, what's going on with, you know, um, employee empl applicants. We're not getting that much applicants right now for jobs. Um, so it just depends on the season and what's going on. But for right now, and probably throughout the rest of this school year, we're going to be doing the four day a week, 10 hour day schedule at one of my sites. And that's the larger location. It doesn't really work for us at the smaller location. 
but we have some creative uh, scheduling going on there as well. That's great. And I love how thoughtful you are, but what we're here to start to talk about opening your own center, which I don't want to scare anyone, but that that work week looks more like seven, 10 hours or seven, 10 hour days. And I'm not kidding. I, I work them like I work every Saturday and Sunday as a CEO. Um, I do love it. I do love it. Um, but uh, but again, if you're searching for the four day work week or the three day three twelves, you ain't going to get it as an entrepreneur. Um, but with that said, totally excited about this session. And I will let you twist and tweak and do your thing. And I'll be back um, to help with questions at the end. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Scott. All right. Hi, everybody. If you guys are familiar with me or if you came to this webinar from my platforms and how I normally do my webinar Wednesdays, you'll know that I'm not nor in my normal uh office setting. I, like Scott said, I am in Texas. I don't spend a lot of time here. This is only my second time here ever in life. I came here last week for a conference and I stayed um, to visit my mom because my mom is currently living in Texas. So I'm at my mom's house. So please forgive me if there's issues with like the signal. If you can't hear me, just let me know in the chat. Um, if somebody walks by, I apologize. Um, but I'm going to do my best. And I'm so excited to be here. I love um, uh, working with Kangaroo Time. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we can get started. If you guys have any issues seeing this or um, any issues at all, please just let me know. Um, so like Scott said, I'm here to talk to you guys about how to start a childcare business. And um, I kind of put my own spin on it because we are currently in a uh, pandemic. Um, I opened my second location in September of 2020, my second center-based location. So it was very much in the middle of what we're all experiencing. And um, I just, figured I would kind of share what has been working for me, especially if you're considering starting up a program now within the next couple of months, we're still going to be very much dealing with this COVID-19 issue, even if um, rules are starting to relax uh, in most states. Um, we still might have to deal with like safety precautions. Um, so let's get started and I'll share a little about myself first. So before I get in, into everything, I'll introduce myself really quick. Like I mentioned, I'm a multi-site uh, child care business owner. My centers are located in Long Island, New York. Um, and in addition to owning a pre preschool programs, I create digital content on YouTube, um, specifically for people like yourselves, childcare providers, center owners, family daycare operators, aspiring childcare business owners. Um, there's so much content that I share on my YouTube channel that includes experiences that I have faced over the years that I've, I've been doing this since um, not too long but since 2014 in different modalities. I've had group family daycares in Queens, New York, and um, now as a multi-site uh, center owner. So definitely check out the videos on that channel if you would like. And then a few years ago, I began consulting because I got so many questions from people that were watching those videos in the comment section under my YouTube channel. I got a lot of people asking certain questions about like how I do certain things or how I started my programs. Um, so that kind of over several years sparked me starting up childcaresites.com. Um, so now I balance overseeing my center operations remotely from home um, and uh, managing childcaresites.com and helping 
people like you guys out that want to start up childcare programs or need some help in the beginning stages. And I guess I should also mention that while I am not um, frequently in Texas, I do currently live in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, even though my centers are in New York. So we've got this virtual digital remote um, operation thing down pack. So if anybody's interested in that, you can let me know. Um, so I started out in this industry when I was in high school. I was a senior um, in high school when I started working at a local child care center in my hometown and then began working there full time for my first few years of college. So right before my final year during my undergraduate experience, I opened my very first child care business like I was telling you guys about. Um, it started out of a general curiosity of what it would be like to own my own business and also a strong desire to live on my own. At that time, I was living in an apartment with my friends and our lease was coming to an end um, at the end of my junior year. And I was thinking like, we're about to go our separate ways. Um, and I had a different friend that told me about the concept of home daycare. So I didn't know that that existed. Um, which, so I had never heard of it before. Uh, so this is actually, these are photos of my first home daycare location that I opened up in Queens, New York. Um, and it was called Big Steps Prep. And I was licensed for 16 children, 12 children under the age of five, I guess, before going into kindergarten and four additional uh, school age children for after school or summer care. And that was certainly an experience. And I learned a lot from it. Um, a few years after operating my home daycare, a family friend approached me with the opportunity to partner with him to open a center-based location in Long Island, which was a bit of a, if you're not familiar with New York, it, Long Island is a bit of a distance away um, from where my home daycare location was. So essentially, I would be starting from scratch at, in a much bigger um, property in an area that I was unfamiliar with and had never been to before. So what I like to normally guide uh, my clients to do is if they have home daycare locations to try to find properties, if, if they're seeking to expand into centers, to try to find properties that are, you know, within the same neighborhood that their uh, home daycare program is in so that they can transition their kids that they have in their home um, seamlessly into into the center base because you have that clientele already um, from your home that would probably have no issues going into your center. But for me, that was not possible because many of my families walked to my house and there was no walking from Queens to Long Island. Um, the first few months was a bit of a struggle for me, as expected, but within uh, about two years, we were able to grow our enrollment to over 100 children registered in the program, um, and we began seeking out expansion opportunities. And of course, the 100 children registered was prior to COVID, and um, it was this, my first center-based location is actually only licensed for 78, so we had to get creative with the sessions um, that we offer, and that's something else I usually talk to my clients about, like even though your license capacity says a certain amount of children, that's how many kids you can have in the building at one time or in your home at one time. If you offer different hours of care for different programs or different sessions, um, you can cycle them out to make sure you don't exceed your capacity, but you're maximizing your space, right? Um, a few, I opened my second center base location this past summer, and this is a photo in front of that. Um, it was a very exciting time for us and somewhat stressful, but I was able to get it licensed within 38 days of signing the lease and um, 
with that, which, which I believe is pretty speedy in comparison to other licensing processes that I've experienced. Uh, I think with my home daycare, a question that I get asked a lot is like, how long does it take to open? Um, and with my home-based location, it took me about six to seven weeks um, from the day that I submitted my license application to the day that they gave me my license. Um, and for my center-based location, it took about three months, the first center. But this one only took 38 days. So I was beyond happy and proud of myself. Um, but one thing I realized while marketing my second location this past summer is that we put a lot of time, effort, and energy into creating a high quality experience for our families. We do try to go above and beyond to make sure we make anything um, we can the most convenient for them on top of ensuring that their children are healthy, safe, and provided a great educational program. So with that, we've gotten great reviews over the years and praises from families. So we wanted to begin promoting that to prospective families seeking childcare. So in our marketing efforts, we placed, we began placing five stars on everything, our website, on our building, on our flyers, we make it clear that this is a five star preschool. But what does it mean to be a five star childcare business? Uh, one thing that I realized while marketing is um, because we put a lot of time, effort, and energy into creating a high quality experience for our families, we go above and beyond and we want to make sure that families recognize that. So um, five stars can have many different meanings, but if you truly believe and have proof behind it, you can absolutely highlight how you demonstrate excellence in your program. Um, five stars for you can mean your rating with your local QRIS. Um, honestly, in right now, our QRIS in New York is Quality Stars of New York. We do not have a five star QRIS rating because when we first got it was when we first opened and most people just open with a one star rating, um, but that's not the only thing that we go off of. Um, for you guys, for everybody else, if you're not in New York, you want to Google and search what your local QRIS is. Maybe in your state there isn't even five stars. Maybe the maximum is four and you want to if, if a lot of families focus on QRIS ratings, maybe that's something that you want to advertise yourself as like a four-star program or a three-star program, if that's the maximum and if that's honestly what you have. And if you're labeling it as this is our QRIS rating, but it can also be the reviews on search engines. So Google, Yelp, um, Facebook. For us, we have great ratings on Facebook and on Google, um, and that's where our five stars come from. Um, it could be social media reviews, like I said, Facebook or anything else that has a rating system. Um, five stars can mean the quality of services provided. Maybe you have, maybe you're affiliated with an accreditation program or you plan to be affiliated with an accreditation program that gives out a certain number of stars um, or just you know from the experiences that you have and what your families say, your testimonials that you have high quality childcare services. Um, you can also, uh, five stars can mean you're successful and you have a successful and dedicated team. Um, a few months ago, back in January, I actually released a course on my website um, that goes into much more detail about how to start a daycare, but specifically a highly rated one. Um, so that is available on childcaresites.com if anybody is interested. Um, but I wanna shift a little towards pivoting uh, your opening process during the pandemic, which we are still very much in especially depending on your location. So prior to COVID in my centers, we did, well, in, at that prior to COVID, I only had one, but in that one center, we did on-site tours, 
We did in-person interviews for staff. Um, we only had just traditional on-site instruction for all of our children. Um, and we had live events, which I cannot wait to get back to. We really used to make a huge deal about like holiday parties, concerts, graduation. I just, I can't wait to get back to those types of things. Um, and we would also visit a lot of local schools and businesses. Um, so the school district that we're in, we used to go there often and drop off flyers and just different things to try to be friendly with the um, secretaries and different school staff that could have, you know, some influence over where parents send their children to. And like, we can't do those things anymore because it's not COVID safe. It's not appropriate, right? Um, so what we do instead now is we do video tours, which I think is super convenient. Um, I'm actually thinking about creative ways to include like some sort of concierge service or um, some auto, I, I just to go off topic a little, I um, looked into a marketing company, not a marketing company, a, um, what do they do? they create animation graphics basically. So I was looking for a company that could do animation graphics and I stumbled across a website that does it. And in with all the questions that I had, they immediately scheduled, like I was able to from their website schedule a virtual like Zoom meeting immediately. And I feel like that's something that I, it was convenient for me. I appreciated it. I got my questions answered right away. And I'd love to do something like that um, uh, for my own programs. So uh, with virtual tours, which is the video tours, we do tours through Zoom um, for families that are not comfortable or if we're going through a time where we're not comfortable or unable to have families come into the building, we'll schedule a Zoom tour. Um, we do Zoom interviews, which is super convenient. I don't think we will ever go back to doing the first interview with um, employee candidates in person. Having it done through Zoom is great. Um, and of course, you can bring them in after to kind of you know, see how they operate in the classroom. Um, after you uh, look at, uh, do their interview virtually and see if they even show up for that. <laughs> um, we also support hybrid and remote learning. So we never used to have a school age program or a kindergarten program and we do now because of COVID. And that's one way that you guys can probably pivot or think about incorporating into your business model if you're considering starting up a program. Um, it might be best for you to consider if you if you haven't having a kindergarten program for families that are not really comfortable sending their five year old or sometimes for me I have a late birthday I started kindergarten at four years old. Um, their four year olds to public schools with hundreds of kids, they might feel more comfortable uh, enrolling with you and that was definitely the case for us last September. So we have a small class size of kindergartners who were with us the year prior that did not want to register at the public schools for this school year. Um, and we also have uh, school age children that are in grades K to six who have virtual learning whose parents did not want them to go to school um, in person, but also have to work so they drop them off to our center so we can support their learning. Um, we also hold meetings virtually, which honestly is not my favorite thing. I really would love to go back to doing in-person meetings with my staff, um, but it's safest if we can separate out into, well, a lot of people in different states do their meetings regularly, but for us in New York, we really are encouraged by licensing to 
try to keep our staff as separate as possible as of right now. I'm not sure if those rules will change anytime soon, but because of that, we're not comfortable risking all of our staff being together at the same time for hours on end in the same room. So we hold meetings virtually on Zoom, or if it is kind of on site, we have our staff stay in their classrooms um, on Zoom with their teachers they would normally be in have the meeting and then focus on organizing, cleaning their room and um, doing lesson planning um, afterwards. We also have virtual concerts for Christmas and holiday stuff um, and virtual events. And instead of visiting local schools and businesses for marketing efforts, we have in the one we were opening our second location this summer, we sent packages, care packages to families homes, um, which really worked. We had a lot of families call us um, that had inquired before and register their kids after that. We've also had to be transparent. We've had COVID cases where we had to close down um, our program before. And during that time, we um, gave care packages out to those that tested positive. Um, and that was much appreciated as well. So the number one tip that I have to help those of you that are thinking about starting a childcare business right now um, or trying to improve the quality of your services is to keep open communication with all parties involved. Um, so before beginning the application for my second location, I reached out to my licensor to find out what has changed and uh, what I could expect. I told her the my hypothetical scenario of opening a second center um, at that time and asked what it would entail. So before signing the lease for my second location, a few weeks prior to that, I started having conversations with my licensor because um, I hadn't seen them. <laughs> I hadn't seen them in a year. I didn't know like what the current process was for opening a, a center. Um, if we would even get the inspections that we were supposed to get, how that was like, what a time frame was going to be. And that was super important um, to us because we were on a tight budget. We didn't have a lot to spend. And many of you, if you're just starting out, might be in the same situation. So I would say before you start signing any documents, um, yes, there might be certain information about the startup process on your state or local um, uh, licensing website. However, you, I would call to confirm um, if the information is accurate because it might be outdated. It might have never been updated with COVID um, and you never know what's going on. So call and ask, but also if you find a property or a house um, or a commercial property, whatever it is that um, the landlord or the seller is you know, willing to work with you, be open about the fact that you're not really sure um, what is going to happen or how long it's going to take and at, negotiate definitely negotiate to see if you can if you're renting if you can get what's called a concession where you do not have to pay rent for a certain period of time or your rent could be discounted for a certain period of time as you go through your licensing process just be honest about where you are what you expect and have a solid plan in place and also, um, if you're already at the point where you have opened your center or your home daycare location and you're wondering how communication can be applicable to you, um, one thing that we did at the start of the pandemic was I started like um, a web page on our company's website where it's all just information about our current policies and procedures related to COVID. Anytime there is an a concern or an update or a shift in the way that we operate, I will send out a text message that that web page has been updated. If you're not skilled in like web development or like, and it's honestly not a skill that I have either. I use Wix.com to create my website 
and you could too very easily. Um, but if you prefer not to do that on your own or you can't, you can have a social media account or send out an email blast, but just keeping like letting families and staff know what is changing, when it's going to change, and try to give as advanced notice as possible because you don't want to wait until there's an issue um, in order to effectively communicate. All right. Um, so a question that I do get a lot from my clients is, is this a good time to start a childcare business? And I would say that yes. And here's why it may be a great time. Um, for many of you, you might either not be working. Um, if you are teachers or uh, professionally a teacher, we're hiring, we're looking for teachers and we're not finding many. <laughs> so maybe you're in the category of teachers that are staying home for a while. So you might have more spare time available to focus on your personal and career goals, which is great. So because of that, you might have more time that you can dedicate to thinking about like, is this the direction that I want to go? Because a lot of people jump into starting up childcare businesses and quickly realize um, uh, or get a reality check that this is not, <laughs> this is not where you want to be. It's definitely challenging to own a childcare business, but it can also be rewarding. Um, and it's, but it's hard work, right? So there's more time available to you to focus on whether or not this is something you actually want to do. And if you know that this is what you want to do, or if you're already in it, you have more time to focus on, you might have lower enrollment, or it just might be slower in general than it normally is because of the pandemic where you can focus on your next step. Um, it's also uh, probably, and I'm not, I'm not a real estate expert, but in most places, it's probably cheaper real estate right now and a lot more flexibility with your landlords, uh, potential landlords, right? There's a lot of vacant properties or people going out of business and landlords might be more willing to negotiate now more than ever. Um, there's also a lot of grants, loans, and government funding. A couple of weeks ago, I did a webinar with someone that um, helps to prepare taxes for uh, child care providers. Her name is Nakia, and um, she has also secured hundreds of thousands of dollars, helped providers secure hundreds of thousands of dollars um, in government funding. Um, so that's an op opportunity right now. And there's definitely more new opportunities to be creative with services offered. So like I mentioned before, we never used to do virtual tours. We never used to do virtual interviews. And more importantly, we never used to um, have a revenue stream of ch school age children being on site with us doing remote learning where teachers were just essentially helping them stay connected to their um to their classrooms uh to their classroom teacher in elementary school we also at the start of the pandemic and um i think we started it in april or may probably april of 2020 until the end of last school year for about three months we had our own virtual preschool program which was definitely a sight to see it was not easy, but we had great, um, two great teachers helping us run that program that had to work from home at that time um, and ran it well. And we had families paying for that service. They were paying to keep their kids home and do virtual preschool with us. Um, so that's definitely a creative uh, service that you could potentially offer. And I know that um, there's still some uh, preschool child care providers, child care businesses, preschool teachers, um, different people that are still doing that sort of structure. We stopped in, in July of 2020, but um, there are a lot of programs that are still just doing virtual programs and charging for it. So if that's something you're interested in, look into that. You also might find that there's reduced competition 
competition resulting from other businesses closing. So like I mentioned before, um, there, there's a lot of programs that might not have pushed, been able to push through the pandemic, right? Um, or maybe there were already providers that were on the brink of retirement. Um, and this was kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back. That's kind of how we got our second center base location. Um, However, the owner of the previous center that was operating there was not retiring. He just was not really too interested in following the rules and regulations surrounding um, owning a licensed childcare program. And um, when I reached out to him with the opportunity to take over the lease, he jumped on it and was super excited that, you know, now he's our landlord and that works out great for him. So there's different creative ways that you can approach um, property owners um, to see if you can get your program in there. Um, and same for home for mm -hmm. homes. Um, so I would say, yes, this is a great time to open a childcare business. Um, I think it's also important to remember that as you're starting up your childcare business, that you share your story, whatever it might be. It doesn't have to have anything to, it doesn't have to include anything to do with COVID, right? You can, there's probably, there should be a different reason that you're starting up a childcare business. Um, what is it? You might need to take some time to figure out why you want to do it and be able to cr creatively share the reason why as you're getting started because people connect with that reason and it will be great for finding your ideal family when you do open um, or as you're opening and building a wait list, you wanna make sure that the families that are on that wait list are families that align with your vision of your program. Um, so creating what that vision is um, and who your ideal family is and the reason why you're opening and why you're choosing to serve these families is important. And it's also uh, great for you to understand the different modalities of care. I, as I've been saying throughout this presentation, you could choose to go the center-based route or home, um, but there are different modalities. There's home daycare programs, there's um, smaller programs than that that are in apartment buildings. Um, in New York specifically, the difference between the two would be that homes are called home uh, group family daycares and in smaller houses or apartments, it would be considered a family daycare and the license capacity is different. Um, and you could have a center or you can have a school age program that only has children that are registered in grades K to six um, or whatever the equivalent is in your, your local area or state. So there's different options for you to consider for modalities. And as I mentioned before, there's creative services. Um, outside of an in-person childcare service, I've seen so many different creative virtual services. Like I mentioned before, you could, also, you could offer virtual preschool in addition to your um, uh, in-person program, like I did back in the spring of 2020. Um, you could also create content. I've seen a lot of um, childcare businesses kind of take advantage of the YouTube for kids that recently released. Um, there's a YouTube kids app, I think. And as a content creator, you can make videos specifically for children. And uh, you might not have a high subscriber count, but you will more than likely have high, high views. And that could be um, a revenue stream in itself. Um, there's also funding opportunities. Like I mentioned before, if you currently own a business, there are so, and, and by that, I mean like you're operating some sort of business. I don't think you have to have a, a tax ID or an EIN, but a, 
If you currently own a business, there are so many different grant opportunities available or government financial relief programs that are that were released within the past year that you might be missing out on if you're not following the news or a part of certain communities in your area that are talking about them. Um, I know that outside of the Paycheck Protection Program loan, the PPP that everybody is talking about over the past year, um, and outside of the EIDL, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, that are available right now. If you're in the US, um, I know that the SBA has made some amendments to the rules for their regular loan programs, I think. Um, and you should absolutely fact check me with someone that is a CPA or the SBA themselves, you can call them and ask. Um, but I believe that there's also some funding in certain areas directly for childcare providers. I know that both of my centers right now accept um, the Essential Worker Scholarship Program. So in New York specifically, and I know that many other states within the US have done this as well, but there's a scholarship program created for families that are, um, I think typically it's for just families that are essential workers and fall under a certain, um, uh, the fe federal poverty income level. Um, that's usually higher, way higher than what subsidies would pay. So a lot of our families are on this scholarship program right now and have been since it was released in the spring of 2020. Um, so that might be something that you look into. But again, regarding the SBA stuff and other loans, I'm not a financial advisor or a CPA or an accountant. So please speak to an expert or someone that you can connect with locally to help you with um, those sorts of things. Um, and regarding competition, you might be located in what's considered to be a child care desert. So even if you, or not just located, but you might be thinking about opening your program in an area that's a child care desert. So um, not uh, considering the fact that any programs might in your area might choose to close or not reopen after being closed for COVID. Um, you might find that just in general, there's a higher demand for childcare anyway. Even if no center or no home daycare program closes, there's a lot of places throughout the US that are considered deserted in regard to childcare and might need you to open your program. Um, so you can, there's, websites and things that you can find online in order to figure out whether or not you're in a child care desert and um, see if it would be beneficial for you to open in that location. Um, like I mentioned before, there's a lot of businesses that have closed down permanently, including child care programs. I know in New York, you can um, find out like I don't really like to share this often because it can kind of seem strange, but what I, I, even prior to COVID, what I would do often is look on our child care licensing agency's website um, as if I was searching for child care if I was a parent. There's usually a child care search page um, wherever you are in, in the U.S., and you can find programs that have their license status or their registration status in, in the negative, whether it is being suspended or revoked or having issues of some sorts. That's how I found my second location. Like I mentioned, my landlord now, when he had a, uh, when he was running the center, he didn't like following. He openly just did not want to follow the rules and regulations and constantly was getting violations because of it. And that's how I realized he might be willing to exit the business. Um, so maybe that's something you look into outside of just, you know, whether the program was closed due to COVID. Have they been struggling for years? Are they constantly getting violation after violation after violation? Is their license always in bad standing? You, you might find that someone's just really over the business and looking for an out. Um, an owner seeking to exit the business. Um, 
your services, even outside of those things, if you don't find, uh, if you're not in the desert, if you're not, if you don't find a business that's closed down, or if you don't find an owner willing to exit the business, I truly feel like you might have services that might be unique. And um, if you don't, maybe you can think of services that could be unique to your area or the area you're considering opening and just open anyway. I'm not someone that's afraid of competition. I kind of quite literally mind my own business and um, I've been successful in doing that. If uh, I feel like this is a good opportunity, I'm gonna go with it. However, um, I do understand a lot of people would prefer to do like a needs-based assessment of certain areas. So there's different options there. Um, on my website, you'll find, just to wrap it up, this is my last slide and I realize we have only five minutes left, but um, on my website, you can find other low cost courses, including that five steps to start a five-star childcare business. Um, you can also, if you have more detailed questions or want to work with me personally, virtually, um, you can book a private one-on-one -on -one video consultation to discuss your business needs or your startup ideas. Um, and there's so much more on that website. So definitely check it out. But that's it for me. And I'm definitely open for questions now, Scott, if you're ready. Yeah. Um, so, so actually, long story short, I've been really leaning in and trying to learn about the business of childcare because, you know, we, we build software and um, I think the real estate, the real estate situation right now is super interesting. Danny, you said you partnered with somebody. Um, did they buy a building and then you went and operated in it? Was that kind of the agreement? Yeah, so um, that was for the first location when we opened initially. He's not my partner anymore. I'm actually in business with my dad, so that's kind of fun. He, um, My dad bought out who was my partner a few years ago from my first center-based location. Um, but yes, that's exactly what he did. He had no real interest in operating a daycare. He didn't know anything about daycare. He purchased the building and um, invested in, in, in it that way. And he is still currently our landlord. Yeah. It, and it, for a lot of real estate entrepreneurs, and, and you know, I'm an entrepreneur, I do software companies, but my wife and I have also done um, real estate there's a nice there's a nice set cross section of real estate called triple net, um, so so, and these and these these arrangements are built around what they call triple net leases. So, um, as as the operator, um, you you manage taxes, you manage all the improvements of the building, you have control over everything, but you pay lesser rent to a triple net. Um, property holder. So, so all they do is they, they own the property outright, or they finance the property, you pay them, you take care of all your stuff, and you can really control your rent by doing that. And you don't need that big capital outlay as an entrepreneur, you can go in and say, hey, buy this building, I promise you, things look good, I'll be in business the next 10 years, you collect your 6000 bucks a month, or whatever it is, you know, depending on how big the, the facility is. Yeah. If it's, if it's 10,000 square feet, yeah, I mean, you, you've got to negotiate a heck of a lease. Um, so, so yeah, there are ways to do it with the right real estate partners. And, um, and we had a question come in about, uh, let me read it. Um, so mortgage versus leasing slash renting. How do you decide between the two options? I think the, the answer, Danny, is it's all about the unit economics, right? Like if, if you have the capital, the ability to raise capital and go and get a building, that is probably a better long-term play to own the real estate. But again, your focus is as an operator. And if that's a barrier to entry, do what you can to get the business rolling like you did with a partner. Hey, go buy the real estate. I, I'll pay you rent and I'll make the business work. Um, and, and, and I'll tell you, so any thoughts there on, on that? 
I completely agree. Um, and I'm definitely not opposed to rent, uh, leasing property. Um, oh, can you guys hear me? I think I totally, froze. you sound like a professional broadcaster. Of course you can hear you. <laughs> okay. I think I, I thought I froze. Okay. I see every, I see it clearly now. Um, but yeah, I don't, I, I don't have any problem with leasing. Um, I, both of my centers are leases still right now. We are, you know, trying our best to figure out how to get commercial loans to purchase property because that we do want that to be our next step just to be fully transparent. But um, I have have no issues with leasing if you have a good lease that's long term and if if you think about it most commercial leases are usually like at least five years ours are 10 years at both locations yeah. Within 10 years we can def if if for some reason our landlord chooses not to renew, I would hope and I know for a fact my businesses are going to be in great positions by the end of our term to find, you know, a different site that we can either move transfer into purchase or move our kids into and we would start thinking about that stuff like at least a year or two out before the lease ends um i do not recommend doing like one year leases or two year leases no way. you want to yeah you want to make sure you have a good long term lease but uh yeah start where you are with what you have where, wherever you can all of that danny you i'll have tell to. you yeah the triple net leases are pretty common and somebody had asked, can you make improvements to your own rooms? And, and yes, if you are in a triple net agreement. And guys, this is something that I'm learning about because um, again, my wife's in real estate and, and, and the, the, the broker called it mailbox money. Like, hey, if you have trust that the operator is gonna be in business for a long time and you can get a 10 year lease signed, that the calculation on how a, a real estate person would buy real estate, they love those deals. They love them. So um, let's move on to a couple more questions. And guys, we're going to go five minutes over. Danny, are you okay to go five more minutes? I'm fine with that. I'm sorry. My presentation was so long. No, that just means we are, we are on the way like, we are leaning into great content. So I've got one here from Octavia. It says, I own a multi-unit that has two tenants uh, that has tenants in two units but the above ground basement is empty. And this is what I would want to use as a daycare. Would that be considered a home base or family daycare or commercial? So I'll lean in here too. And I, Danny, I think you'll have some interesting perspectives being in New York. Um, mm -hmm. So I've seen a lot. So I was in Brooklyn um, a, few, a few weeks before COVID started. And uh, I was at this site that had an actual upstairs and downstairs. And the owner told me, hey, we're, we're grandfathered in. We can actually have an upstairs and a downstairs. You know, most centers now in New York, the licensing's tough to get a, to get a, a multi-level unit building, or you can't have infants on the second floor. There are all kinds of like regulatory constraints. Also in our building in Buffalo, it's a high rise, um, it's a beautiful structure, and we have so many new companies moving in. Everybody wants a child care center, and nobody can get um, licensing to approve a child care center that's not at ground level. So, so you have to consider first call. First call for Octavia, you've got to call licensing, have them come and put eyes on it, and tell you what's possible. Now, as far as like what you can get licensed for, um, I think you alluded to it earlier, Danny. That's all about um, about um, you know the structure, the the proximity to licensing. Any thoughts there? I mean, I know you know New York rules, um, but that's that's a call from licensing, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it could be very different wherever you're located. If you're in the US, um, different states might have different rules. And honestly, within the same state, there might be different rules. In New York specifically, if you're in New York City, one of the five boroughs, and starting a center-based location, that you have a whole different set of regulations than you do if you're anywhere else starting a center-based location outside of New York City. So that's something to consider. Um, but to go back to 
to that uh, Octavia's question, I'm not sure if by multi-unit you mean that you have like multi, like mixed use commercial and- That's what it sounded um, like, Danny. That's kind of what it, yeah. in my opinion, yeah. Like it's a mixed use right. commercial facility. Right. So if that's the case, then definitely contact licensing. I think, I think, and I could be wrong about the rules, but I do believe that it is possible for you to use a lower level, not necessarily a, I think there's a difference in New York specifically between basement and cellar, like the terminology matters. Um, so I believe you can have children in a lower level um, area. Um, if, if you have certain things in place. And same for home daycare locations. My first home daycare site was on the first floor, but this I had to move a couple years after opening my home daycare and I moved into a different house and started a, a different daycare program that had the daycare on the kind of considered the basement level. And it was only acceptable because I had a door to the backyard and a door to the front of the house and certain ceiling height. Um, so it really varies. Um, and I think New York is more strict than a lot of other places, but I, like Scott said, um, start with licensing. Whatever question, what? hypothetical question you have, ask your licensor. You don't even have to give your name. Yeah, so Octavia, so she's kind of giving us more color. She says it's duplex and it with an above ground basement um, and it's in Philly. So again, reach out to your regional licensing consortiums, have them come in. So you're either looking at a family child care home, an FCC, or um, or like Danny said, a uh, what, what was the other terminology that we use in New York, a group? A uh, group, group family. Yeah, so so you'll get you'll get kind of like by structure, by egress, like your emergency exits, you're gonna get a ruling, and it, it is what it is. Like, um, but but you'll get guidance here. So you'll either be able to license to, with six or twelve, or I don't know what the group home parameters are in PA. Um, but yeah, you, you could have a viable business there, and it's an interesting way to go about it. Um, so uh, so. It, Let's let's kind of wrap here. I know we're over on time, Danny. This just means we got to do. I'd love to do an intensive um, yeah. uh, uh, segment on just real estate because I think I think the largest barrier to entry, like you can go to Chris Murray and get help with marketing, or Danny, your content. Um, there's a lot of help with marketing, but when it comes to acquiring a site, getting it spun up communicating with licensing, understanding where you sit and inside a child care desert or not, whether or not you can get uh, um, grant funding. I mean, one of the most powerful modalities that an early entrepreneur can have is capital. And if you can get a free $2,000 um, just, just to make the first month work, or if you can get a $10,000 grant because you're in a child care desert, you need that. Like th these are so critical. And, and Danny, I, we, we have been, we have seen so many of our operators as a software company, so many of them that took chances on this crappy little early software company called Kangaroo Time with a terrible name or whatever, and, and kind of a, a goofy founder. And, and we saw them take us on because they, they were a family childcare home and now they have 10, 10 center-based businesses. Uh, so, so we are such advocates of, of watching many of you early entrepreneurs spread your wings. And, and like uh, uh, Octavia said before, like, what do I do with this, this building? I have this vision, I wanna get it started. Um, Ramisha, I see your question from Dallas, Texas. I'll write you personally an answer. Uh, Fatima, um, there's, oh, the potential of a Dick's Sporting Goods store and if you could lease it and make the unit economics work. Let me just, let me close with this on real estate. Um, for those of you that, um, that know uh, uh, Kathy Ligden uh, and, and her team at Hinge Brokers, um, I have a personal check-in with Henry Tiberian. He's, he's a real estate broker and he is such a, uh, he has the heart of a teacher and, and just the, that spirit of, of, 
of just being like wanting everybody to learn. Um, they, they, their brokers will kind of walk you through the unit economics. And one of the great things I learned at the Hinge conference last year was there's this beautiful strike zone in childcare. And, and they were telling us that the unit economics really work with licensing and number of children that you can have with buildings that are between 10 and 12,000 feet. Like opening a business is always hard, but if you can start with the right size structure and understand your utilization and how the unit economics work, if you can find a building that's between 10 and 12,000 feet, that is a beautiful strike zone. Anything smaller, it limits you as far as number of, of children that you can license. And Danny, I know your schools, um, your schools are probably a little bit smaller, but you wor they work for you. You're in New York. Um, New York's totally different. The real estate paradigm's different. Um, but anyway, this is stuff that I'd love to geek out on. And if you would commit to, I'm putting you on the spot right now. Let's do another session and let's do a late one like this because I think more people can get to them. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I'm, you know, I'm always open to webinars with kangaroo time. I love you guys. We love you. We love you. Um, so, so yeah, guys, um, we are Genevieve. Can you do me a quick favor? Can we copy paste all the questions and in our follow-up email, I'll work on some answers tonight uh, and, and maybe look up some resources. I would love to be helpful here. Um, for those of you that are, that are thinking about beginning that journey as an entrepreneur, we absolutely need you. Guys, the one thing that I think that um, COVID taught us all was how essential um, early educators are and how essential those entrepreneurs are that are committed to building their businesses and serving this very underserved segment and, and what drives our economy, how important you all are. So we are here to support you. We don't care if you use our software. That's not what we're here for. Um, we like that. That would be great. Uh, and we think it's the best and we think it'll make your business better, but we're not here to pitch you. We're here to help you. With that said, Danny, um, your content as always is nails. I loved it. Um, I, I was like sitting on the edge of my seat like, thinking, should I break in? Because I really want to like geek out on this real estate question. Um, oh, you <laughs> I'll do it next time. I promise. Yeah, I, promise. Time. I know I'm too much. I'm too much. I, too much. Um, but with that said, Danny, we love you. Thank you so much for bringing such great content. Everybody on the call, I can see the passion in the chat and in the QA here. I've got like three monitors up. Um, we'll do this. Uh, I'll work with Genevieve tonight. We'll get you guys some some extended answers on some of the things we didn't get to. And stay tuned. We have three more webinars in the month of May. May is a really busy month. Uh, Genevieve, who am I supposed to promote here before we, we jump off? So next week we have Latrice Crawford who will be joining us, which will be a marketing, uh, which will be a marketing webinar. And then we're also bringing back Prerna Richards. She's going to talk about uh, challenging behaviors in the classroom. And then we have Alita Mechdel, and she's going to actually talk about staffing solutions. Um, these are all happening this month. You'll get a follow-up email with all of these webinars in them and registration links. And I also want to say we have had so many great questions. We will respond to all of them. I also put in the chat. Danny's Facebook group called the Child Care Clubhouse. That is an incredible resource if you are looking to start your own center. Um, people in there all the time are asking about everything from how do I, you know, sign a lease? Um, you know, what software do I need? How do I create a handbook? So it's all the questions that you need answered right in there. So I highly recommend joining hey, that. Genevieve, and we'll also Genevieve, you're going to be mad at me for this, but anybody starting their own child care center I will give you software for the first few months. I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you for free. Genevieve hates when I do this because she's like, we, we try to be really thoughtful about our pricing and I can't help it. We will we'll give you software. We just want to launch you. Just just go. That's a great value, guys. I love, <laughs> I have the Kangaroo Time software and I love it. Good. Oh, thank it's you. It's getting Danny. better too, Danny. It's getting better. Just wait, just wait over the next few weeks. You're, you're gonna have some uh, some great updates that you'll just be in love with this. I, and, and that's my goal. I want every every woman in the world to fall in love with me or, or every childcare owner to fall in love with me. And uh, yeah, I, I always do this, but um, Genevieve, uh, 
let's sign off. Um, we want to thank you again, Danny, uh, Genevieve and Marissa and our team at Kangaroo Time. Thank you so much. And stay tuned. We will have a part two of this session because I just think it's it's so important. But we love you guys. Please reach out if you need anything. Uh, we'll see you in a week. Thanks, guys.